I'm not going to take up any more of your time. Welcome up David Flynn. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Well, I'm going to have to project my voice, so if anyone can hear, just let me know here early on because some of this stuff might get intense, and if you miss one point, you may be lost, and that would be awful. So. But first, starting with the classical education that anybody who got a classical education would know, Plato, the uh, earliest philosophers seem to have their act together. And one of the things that I think is one of the most salient to what I'm going to talk about is geometry. And Plato said that geometry rightly treated is the knowledge of the eternal. Now, just cursory look at that. It's like, well, yeah, he really was into geometry. He was really, really into uh, doing math. And <laughs> that, wasn't, uh, that wasn't the thing, though, because he looked at it as a religion. He's talking about the eternal. And eternity, the attribute of actually possessing eternalness, is something that's ascribed to the main deity. Geometry, of course, isn't just uh, measuring circles and squares and determining angles. It's actually measuring the Earth, the geometry. It's actually incorporating both the name for Earth and measurement. So how can measuring the Earth somehow give us an idea of God? And in addition, eternity connects to time. So how can time be connected to the Earth? Well, maybe we in modern uh, civilization haven't really connected with this understanding. Maybe it's antiquated thinking on Plato's part. But I assure you, there are people who are around right now who have taken this quite literally and incorporated it into their religion. It's a religion of geometry. It's a religion that's connected to this idea of eternity. I'm sure everybody has seen this before. This is a compass and square, and it's, you know, it's not a secret, even though it's a, a symbol of a secret society. And I don't want to step on anyone's toes inadvertently. I'm not going to demonize Freemasons, but I am going to talk about something that I think the highest echelon of the elite understands. And this is the key. The, 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 the uh, compass and square are things that you use to measure course angles and, and, uh, and build things with, but they're also very connected to the idea of maps and measuring distance on a map. And you can actually pick up quite a, a bit of information from the Freemason sites on the internet or other grimoires or books that are out because they, they give us the information that we need to understand pretty much what they understand in the earliest, you know, the earliest levels that they move into. They see the symbols and they uh, incorporate this into each of the uh, initiate degrees. And they measure themselves a, a learned attainment on the degree that they move into. And it's interesting because the name compass in, in Latin is cum passus, which means by degree, by step, by increments. And so it doesn't have to necessarily connect to this idea of a magnetic compass. It doesn't have to be connected to this idea of this compass and square necessarily. It's just anything with degrees in it. So we're talking about primarily circles, but anything that measures circles and also the, the system that actually measures them. And this is where the, the uh, complexity comes in. Why did they just end at 33? Here's, you have a representation of all the orders that you can possibly come up with when it comes to the illuminated fraternities. You have Order of the Knights Templar, Knights of Malta, uh, the Rosicrucians, and the earlier Freemasons, the, the, uh, uh, the Scottish Rite. Um, they list most of them right along this line here. But they end at 33, as high as they go. Well, everybody's had geometry in school. There's 360 degrees in a circle. What's up with 33? I just think that's going to be surprising to you when you see what's happening with it. Here we have Christ himself as the creator of the universe, but he's using the compass, and he's actually creating a circle with it. Here it's in the point. That's how you use it, and you describe 
a circle with it. So he's actually creating something that has degrees too that you measure, and that's also a compass. So, so the actual instrument and the symbol that is actually drawn with it can be considered compasses. Here's something I think that can tie the mystery into what a compass and 33 have going for it. Uh, what's going on with the whole system. This is called a compass rose. It's been used for hundreds of years by navigators <coughs> on the ocean. And it incorporates 32 lines and every one of these words here, for the novice navigator, would have to learn these, these, these directions. They're all different. And you can see this is in a different language than English. So, But basically, it would be north, north by north, northeast, north, northeast. You know, and you'll go all the way through 32 times and then end up at this point, which is 0 and 33. They found that 33 was the most important number in a system of measuring the Earth and traveling on the Earth. In the center of it, they actually incorporate a rose, too. And this cross is pointing to the east, which represents Jerusalem. There's a connection going on there, too. This is known by navigators as boxing the compass. They would memorize all these names, 33 of them, from 0 to 32. And 32, of course, would be 0 at the same time. So you have the sublime 33 degrees. Or if you were going to talk about a perfect third, you have 33.33333 degrees. So they seem obsessed with 33. This is an early map from about the 1600s. You can see these compass roses here. They all have 33 lines radiating outward from various places. So what you could do if you knew what your latitude was, which is pretty easy to do. You just keep a heading on one of these lines, and you'll eventually run into land. And here's some early navigators incorporating the compass roses. You can even see some red cross motifs in here, too, which are very characteristic of the whole system of navigation connecting to the east. And you'll often hear fellow uh, illuminated fraternity members talking about their fellow travelers. They travel to the east, they're sons of the widow, and they're following the eastern star, and so on and so forth. It's all the same thing. This is a compass whose highest degree is 33 and a third. This is called the compass rose, which is interesting because rose is a play on the word for the Hebrew name of the head, rosh. Here you have the skull and bones. And actual name for Golgotha, which was Aramaic. In Hebrew, Golgoleth is spelled this way. These two letters, if you would actually connect them together, equal 33. GL, GL, or Gimel Lamed, Gimel Lamed. And this is a Tav. So in the ancient Hebrew, the T was actually a cross. So symbolically, this is 33. 33 and a cross. So the name for a skull, place of the skull, Golgoleth, actually symbolizes the same thing as this. Because it's a head, it's a rosh, just a play in words. And the classical education gave you Hebrew and Greek and Latin. I guess the higher up you go, you get more Hebrew. Here's a rose and the cross, more blatant. And this is what it's all about, Golgotha in Jerusalem. Jesus was, uh, when the, if you actually would look into the grimoires of uh, the Illuminated Fraternities, they say that Jesus was indeed 33, 33 years old when he was crucified and, and rose again. But they also leave out other parts that are important that we can actually look into the Bible to find. In the Torah, you can find that no one would, be, would begin their teaching, uh, their ministry, or their, in, 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 in a, their rabbinical work until they were 30 years old. And so chronologically, they, they ascertain that Jesus was actually baptized at 30 and moved through his ministry for three years, finally ending up here. Now, the plot's going to thicken and also sort of set here. This is a system of measuring the earth that navigators use. It's called uh, 
the navigational system for uh, uh, nautical miles. This is what you use if you're going to fly around the Earth uh, in a spaceship or in a plane because it's a based on ratio, and t it's it's a system based on ratio and time. It's not s statute miles. Statute miles are something different. They're actually aligned to the uh, number of feet that Queen Elizabeth decided would fit into a mile on the Earth. This is based on a ratio. All it is is there's 360 degrees in a circle, and there's 60 minutes in an hour. So if you have a clock and you know how many degrees are in a circle, and you have a good enough uh, a catalog of having measured where the stars are every day for a whole year as we go around the sun, you could move anywhere along in longitude, which is the lines that go up and down like this. You can move anywhere along this Earth and figure out, if you had a good enough clock, where you were by knowing the time and by knowing the system and having a chart. And you can actually measure the distance around the Earth because it's an easy equation. 60 minutes and 360 is 21,600. So there's 21,600 miles around the Earth at its greatest, its, its greatest uh, circumference. It's called the Great Circle. And you have many Great Circle distances in longitude, only one for the equator in latitude because it gets smaller as you move out to the poles. But in olden times, they didn't have 360 degrees. In fact, the 360 degree system in navigation was used, we can ascertain it was 1200 AD all the way up to 1690. Even though there was an understanding that there was 360 degrees in the circle, you never did that with navigation. You just used the basic compass rows. Well, guess what happens when you multiply 60 minutes times 33, or the perfect 33 and a third? Basically, what this is doing is measuring the whole Earth, then, in increments that are just a ratio. And to make it clear, the ratio would be exactly the same for miles on, say, the size of a basketball, as it would for Jupiter or the Sun. It's always going to be the same distance around based on this ratio. It's just a measurement system. So if you actually have only 33 increments around a circle, and you still are using the clock that has 60 minutes in it, you end up with 2012. I'm perfectly honest, 2012 is the number that you have, and the decimal point then is 0.9, which is it's that division between 2012 and 2013. That's a, a significant thing because when you look into uh, the Torah, a child wouldn't actually be responsible for keeping the law until he was in that margin between 12 and 13. Hebrews would measure age from the first year, birth would be one. Not like when we wait till someone actually is born and then hits one. So it's that margin between 12 and 13 where you become responsible for the law. So in nautical miles, then, using 360 degrees in a circle, you end up with a 33.33 degree swath of the Earth equaling this, 2012 nautical miles. What's astounding about this is that this proportion has existed for hundreds of years. That's why 33 is such a big, big, big deal when it comes to the navigators, the travelers to the east, the fraternal orders of Illuminati. There's more to this. It pin, these symbols will pin down exactly why 2012 is significant and other signs that can pin down exactly where it falls chrono chronologically in our history. As you can see, this is a fleur-de-lis. These were put on the north edge of the uh, the compass roses. You'll see it often superimposed with a phoenix, which is significant. A lot of times you'll see all these symbols put together, the compass, the rose, the cross, and the phoenix. You can usually tell the phoenix because it has a little distinctive little tuft of feathers on the back of his head. Looks like an eagle, but it's a phoenix, especially when it's combined with these symbols. This is a kind of a muddy picture, but it's the same idea. The rose, the rose cross up here. Here's a red cross and the compass, and then your phoenix underneath. Very enigmatic. This is a, a rose cross also, and you can see the strange geometric sort of redundancy going on here. They're measuring circles, compasses. And then you have a distinctive 
four animals on each point. What does that mean? One of the most important things then to understand then is their focus of the, 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 the illuminated fraternities on this symbol. This is, uh, uh, Irenaeus in the Middle Ages was able to kind of pull together the symbols from ancient times that you would actually find um, in the Old Testament, um, these cherubim beings that have four faces, and he applied that to the gospel writers. This one necessarily, this one happens to be the gospel writer John. And here they are all represented together, the four gospel writers, and John's down here with, for some strange reason, three crosses on his head. The symbol has three. In the Old Testament, the cherubim were typically drawn with a human face, wings of an eagle, four points of a lion, and then the back part would have been a part of a bull. These ones are almost correct because the tail would curl the right way. This is the Ark of the Covenant. This is the Holy of Holies, a rendition of what it might, might have looked like. And this is an interpretation of what that actually may have symbolized. On the ecliptic of the zodiac, well, the ecliptic is where we sight the sun as it travels around the earth, you'll have 12 major signs. And at the four corners where the stars are the brightest, you have Aquarius, which would be the face of the man, Taurus, the bull. Here, you'd have Scorpio, but in ancient times it was just called uh, Ophiuchus, which was the serpent contender. And it wasn't a scorpion, it was a man stepping on a scorpion holding a snake, and then some other symbols would be this bird an eagle, which also contends with serpents. And then Leo here, who has eagle wings, but it's one of the only images I could get that would look like it was actually made to be in the zodiac. It's interesting, too, that in the Old Testament, the tribes of Israel had symbols that they were given. And they were always supposed to be ordered around the tabernacle in this configuration that, if you look at the symbols, correspond to these four corners of the ecliptic in symbols. And here, the eagle is at the north, which corresponds to the tribe of Dan. There's more to this symbol. You'll see in grimoires and uh, uh, works of uh, Freemasonry a connection between this eagle symbol and this Ouroboros, as it's called, uh, the tail eater, or um, uh, what's young is actually talked about as some symbol that means cycles of time. But it is ubiquitous. It goes all over the world. It's ancient. It's one of the most ancient symbols there are. This is an Aztec one. Here's one from a gravestone in England. Of course, the Chinese one. This one is interesting because it comes from a postcard from Rosh Hashanah. Um, and this is depicted as uh, it's actually a fish that they eat. During, during the beginning of the new year, and it actually says here, Leviton, Leviathan. So if you go and look up Leviathan in, in a concordance, uh, in, a, in a dictionary of Hebrew, you'll actually find out that it does indeed mean to connect a serpentine form connected. And you'll find that if you look at the zodiac and the four corners of the zodiac, there's something very interesting about its configuration in heavens. This is the Milky Way. It crosses two places only on the ecliptic, here and here. And you'll notice that it's right next to the eagle. In fact, it's a very important place because this, the Milky Way, actually does, in fact, appear like a serpent. This is its mouth its eye, and the tail that's going into its mouth. Here's it uh, enhanced for you. And I'm still facing the same way. Here's the mouth and the tail going into the mouth. Here's a close-up of the same thing. And the eagle appears right over its head. This is galactic central point. We're looking at the galaxy that we're in at a very shallow angle, on edge. And this is where the center of the galaxy is. And this always is there on this ecliptic point. It doesn't move along here. 
neither does this side. It's always fixed here. The only thing that moves is our perspective as we move through here when we look at the sun. We're just going around the sun and we're sighting the sun through the zodiac through your, every year. And this is basically where the eagle would appear. Now, I'm sure people are going to start seeing a similarity between the myth of the phoenix rising from the ashes of his demise, a uh, glowing pyre, and being reborn. Because, because this is the area where this actually takes place, it becomes very significant if you know that there's an actual thing that's happening as we move every year through this ecliptic. It's called the precession, and it means that we will sight, we will sight the, uh, I'll move back here. We will sight the sun through here at a certain point in the year, and every year it'll move the most minuscule amount. In fact, it'll take 72 years for us to move one degree and actually see the sunrise in a different place along this ecliptic. It takes exactly 25,920 years to move in one complete circuit. And it's interesting that you'll see this oftentimes in illuminated manuscripts, the word Leviathan here, Leviathan, and then this, it's a circumscribed pentagram. And the reason for that is it's an equation in geometry. It explains precession. Here you have 360 degrees, and between each one of these points, of a circumscribed pentagram, you'll have 72 degrees. Multiply them together, you get exactly the length of time it takes to move one circuit in precession. And that's why it's such a big deal. And quite a few illuminated persons use this symbol without actually understanding it. They just feel it has great power. Well, it does because it explains some of the greatest forces that are taking place all around us, but we can't really define them except through geometry. Another interesting connection here is this uh, Leviathan type symbol surrounded by the zodiac. There's other symbols here too. There's a symbol of a half moon and a star, and it gets pretty in depth. But the main point is that they're related. And the reason they're related is if you know that the ecliptic is crossed by the galaxy in two places, then it becomes very significant then if we actually sight it during one of the cardinal points of our year, say an equinox or a solstice. In fact, it's so significant that you'll actually, if you understand this, go back into history, you'll be able to mark this point in time here that takes, it's actually a quaternary point through the procession that lasts 25,920 years. Divide it in four places, it'll actually equal 6,480 years. You'll find that if you go back from now, 6,480 years, you're ending up in the place where historians peg civilization actually has having been born almost out of nothing. Go back another 6,480 years, you'll end up in every time with a configuration that looks like this. Geologists actually uh, mark that year uh, of two coordinary processions with the division between the Pleistocene and the Holocene, where there was a massive global die off. This is what this looks like. When you reach the point of the procession where you're at that middle place, where the sun's rising in the center of the galaxy, this is how the ecliptics align to it. And this will occur one day out of the whole year. But when this is aligned to one of our equinoxes or solstices, it takes on extreme significance. Because you have all the symbols connect at the same time. Here you have the primordial mound that the uh, Egyptians were talking about, the nest of fire that the phoenix is born from, the sun rising in the nest, activating it, the center of the galaxy, and the ecliptic running through here. And if this is aligned with the solstice or an equinox, all the points are matching because what it means is we've moved through a quarter of the procession, and big things happen then. As I was saying, if you start from 2012, and move back 6,480 years, you end up at the birth of history and civilization. Move back again, the same distance, the division between the Pleistocene and the Holocene, and a massive die-off of more than 90% of the flora and fauna in North America and Europe. Move back again, 
height of the glacial epoch. And before that, you can actually find no trace of uh, the more ancient hominids. Mankind, Homo sapiens, seems to have been uh, installed here on the Earth. And I'm not saying that we were put here from space, but it seems that we didn't have much competition after that point. This is when this symbol will happen again on the winter solstice, 2012. It's happening right now, actually, because the, the actual movement through here is so slow. But it's significant that if you tie this in with the 33rd and, uh, 33 and a third degrees in the navigational system that's revered by the illuminated societies, you end up with quite a lot of significance to these things. You can actually see more of, or actually understand more of what's going on with the phoenix when you see it's been made into, uh, in the Rosicrucian um, lore, a double-headed thing with the sun rising in the middle. It's symbolizing the beginning of time and the ending of time, the division of time, and that place where the heavens actually divide time. If you go to any Masonic uh, uh, building where rituals are held, where you go to meet, if you are part of the, the whole group of the echelons of, of the illuminated fraternities, you'll find that they've been dedicated to two Johns, always the two Johns, the ones that bracket the, uh, the, the gospel, John the Baptist and then John the Revelator. He's symbolized by a double-headed eagle, always surmounted by the number 33, and inscribed in the floors of a uh, Masonic hall will always be these two posts, which symbolize the two Johns and the sun in the center of it, which is hearkening back to that symbol of what happens when the sign of the end of the age happens, that, that coordinary division of the procession. Every Freemasonic Free Lodge has one of these. And they're usually perched on top, uh, sculptures. And uh, this is from uh, uh, Morals and Dogma, the book that's given to most initiate Freemasons. This is a Rosicrucian symbol. We've incorporated all these things too. But it's trying to say that there's a future point that's significant. Here's all the points connected, 33 and a third, order out of chaos. In every one of the cases where you go back 6,480 years, there was some sort of destructive epic that came onto the earth. You can read it historically. You can read it in Timaeus by Plato. You can read it in the geology. It follows a pattern. You have the double-headed eagle here. Actually, the phoenix being reborn from the ashes of, a, of the previous destruction. Because it's, it's kind of a paradox. It's both created and destroyed at the same time. It looks back to the past and forward to the future. Well, if you're navigating, it is also important to realize where you are on the planet. And with respect to 33 and a third, there's something very interesting about that. Because 33 latitude and 33 longitude, both above and below the equator, are only touching one place on this planet on actual terra firma. And I looked into this with a little bit more scrutiny because our modern longitudinal line based on the Greenwich Meridian was only installed in 1884 during the Global uh, Meridian Conference. Um, Alan Chester Arthur was a president at that time. People from all over the world came to New York and uh, got together to figure out where they were going to put the prime meridian. This is the Paris Meridian, and it was established hundreds of years longer than the Greenwich Meridian. The, the Knights Templars, the, uh, the Crusaders, they would measure the Earth by this line, not this line. Latitudinally, it's a no-brainer. 33 and a third has always been right here, unless, of course, we've been knocked out of our kilter in orbit. But pay special attention to this little place right here, because it is the mountain that's been recorded from antiquity as a place where something extraordinary happened, the most extraterrestrial-like situation you can talk about from history. 33.33 goes perfectly through one of the three peaks of Mount Hermon. And it's distinguished by three peaks in all the literature and exactly through 33.33 here by the Paris Meridian, which is also called the Rose Line. 
And this is what happened here. It's the book of Enoch. It goes into detail, much more detail than the Bible does about it. And because it's an extra biblical text, sometimes it's um, not held up with much esteem. But there are a lot of things it has to say that the fraternities of, illuminate, of the illuminated groups across uh, time have paid special attention to. And it says that when the, men's, the sons of men had multiplied in those days, beautiful and comely daughters were born to them. It's Genesis 6. And the watchers, sons of heaven, saw them and desired them. And they said to one another, Come, let us choose for ourselves wives from the daughters of men, and let us beget ourselves children. And they descended to the peak of Mount Hermon. And this isn't just an Enoch. There's a lot of different text here, too. Mostly obscure as you can get. But you can find them if you need to. Another interesting thing about this general area here is a place called Baalbek, which by the Greenwich Meridian is at 36 degrees longitude. This is called the grand, uh, the, uh, the pregnant stone for some reason by the locals there. It's the largest megalith in existence on our planet. It's about 70 feet, wide, 70 feet long, about 14 feet high, 10 feet wide. It's estimated to weigh over a thousand tons. Here's another perspective of it, the proud flag of Lebanon. And is, this is the quarry that it's supposedly laying in. And is, take a look at the erosion here. This isn't just a few hundred years old, not even just a few thousand years. This has all the hallmarks of having weathered the Pleistocene uh, deluge. There's actually Pleistocene alluvials over the top of it. When this was excavated, it was only a little part of it coming out here, and it was covered by what are called Pleistocene alluvials because they were deposited nearly 13,000 years ago. Here's two gentlemen on what's called here the Grand Terrace. This is called the Trilithon. These aren't as quite as large as the monolith that's laying in the, uh, in the quarry, but they're pretty close, and they're estimated to weigh around 900 tons each. This is about 30, 40 feet up. And these are the th structures that are intact in the area closest to 33 north, 33 east longitude. Here's another perspective, a little man standing next to the site. Well, I looked into some of the uh, etymology of the actual word for the watchers that, that Enoch was talking about. And it's always this word in Hebrew, pronounced er. This is, this is a little different, different to, try to uh, try to say it's a kind of exasperate. You have to actually breathe pretty hard to say that, but it's close to this. Um, you can find the same word here in Daniel, watcher. Different context, but it's still the same word. You can find the word city almost completely unchanged from the idea of watcher and city. And the first time you find it is in reference to when Cain leaves the Garden of Eden and goes to the land of Nod, east of Eden, and actually builds the first city. And I was thinking, what architecture, architectural school did Cain go to to learn how to build? I think that there's something going on between him and the watchers. That's my speculation. But here's some cuneiform of the same word from uh, Sumerian, iri, or iru, and it means <coughs> these three things, city, watcher, and also shining, which is interesting because the watchers are called shining ones quite often, even in modern literature. The, the connection between the abductors of the abductees and <coughs> the watchers of Mount Hermon is uncanny because oftentimes you'll hear the same words that are the most ancient in the descriptions of these watchers from Mount Hermon before the flood. And here you have a direct translation, I guess a transliteration to the Greek from air to arios. Os is the masculine uh, form of the word. Aria would be, say, the warlike attributes of Athena, she would be called Aria instead of arios. And Mars, you just get a good uh, Latin lexicon, actually means to shine. So we go to Mars. And now, You'll actually notice, if you've been following Richard Holguin's work or gone to my website, that this area here on Mars, discovered by the Viking probes, is actually aligned from true north 
of 33.33 degrees. And here it is along the longitudinal line, the meridian, actually, the, gr the, the great meridian they have on Mars, and it's pretty close. It's, it's actually been named by Schiaparelli, Cydonia. And that's very, very compelling because the place where the watchers first came down is also named Cydonia. And Nanas has some very interesting things to say about the people who first came down here and the people who lived there later on who actually bred with them. He calls them divine progeny with the age that's that of the universe. Not many people actually get to see this picture because they've been told it doesn't really exist. It's not really anything on Cydonia except a eroded mesa. <coughs> but this is on the Cydonia area. And this is what Richard Hoagland has said. It's, it's bifaced, which I think is connected to this whole business down here with the watchers because you have one side is a man and the side is a lion. There's even a biblical precedent for this in Ezekiel when he talks about decoration in the inside of the temple. He says the panels of the holy place were made with cherubim and there were palm trees between them and every face faced one direction and had two parts to it. One was of a lion facing one direction, one was of a man facing the other direction and they had it lined out in the wood panels all around the inside of the holy place of the temple that doesn't exist yet. And they oppose each other, these symbols, a man, and a lion directly across from each other. There's a messianic connection to this. The Messiah came first as a man, and he's incarnate as a man, but when he comes again, it is said that he comes as, a, as the conquering lion of Judah. And you'll notice here's the eagle up here on the top. It's interesting because we're not only talking about a messianic sort of type, we're talking about timing, we're talking about a place, and you go on, you can look at Cydonia and learn quite a few things about what's going on here on Earth. Here we have the same geometric figure. It's not a perfect pentagon, but as we are, uh, were looking at earlier, it's a geometric figure that points out precession, and it's extremely ancient. We have the, the analogs on Earth. We also have a connection between it and Mars, the greatest war market making power probably ever, who has a power of the atom, has decided to put all their forces in this one pentagonal building. And the greatest structure we ever have discovered in the world, in our solar system, just happens to be on Mars. The war god. It goes back even farther than this idea of uh, before the flood. It goes all the way back to the very first interaction between human being on this planet and something other than human. This is a, uh, a piece of fruit that's been cut along the equator. And you, of course, notice the nice pentagram in the side, inside of it. Here's another picture of the fruit that was a close-up of. It's a golden apple. And uh, in ancient times, there was no such thing as yellow apples. The only thing that they would actually consider would be the golden fruit, the golden apple. In fact, the fruit that was in the Garden of Eden, as being the golden apple, has a scientific name, Pyrus Cydonia, believe it or not. And here you have the serpent. And uh, he's already handed off this fruit of knowledge. And they're going to eat it, of course. But uh, it's interesting because this is supposed to be an angel in the guise of a serpent, so he doesn't, you know, he, his original place isn't on the planet, Earth. Now, if you look at the ancient symbol here that you find in magic and, and illuminated uh, books of all kinds, it makes a little bit more sense because you have this symbol here. It connects to heaven. It connects to the first transfer of knowledge to men. You have the serpent. It connects to that symbol in the garden. It also connects to how the whole system works in time in the heavens. There's also more connections to the name Cydonia. It's interesting if you actually look at the interchange here between this serpent and the woman. She's, he said, you surely will not die if you eat of this fruit, because God knows the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, 
and you will be like God. Interesting, if you look at the words for open eyes in Greek, it's your opa, Europe. And you'll find these feminine deities often with these big open eyes, you know, just to convey the idea that they can really see a lot and understand things because they're illuminated. It's Europa. It's Eve. It's a play on this idea that's continued into one culture to the next culture, from one civilization to the next civilization, until you have the, the language kind of obscure it, but it's always the same idea. Here's the knowledge-bearing woman, Europa. It's just Eve. She's the first one to connect to some being in heaven. And interestingly enough, in, in Greek myth, Europa was uh, the daughter of a king of Sidon, which is on the Mediterranean coast where Lebanon is now. And she founded Sidonia on Crete, where Gnosis is, where we get the word for knowledge, Gnosis. And here's from Crete itself. You'll see the serpents. You'll see the big bug eyes. She's very matronly, as you can tell. And she has an owl on her head, which symbolizes being able to see where others can't. And she's got all the hallmarks of being someone like Eve, having connected with the serpent. You also see more Martian motifs, too. You have, here's, this is Sidon. This is supposedly a guy who was uh, uh, born on Crete. He's being suckled from a canine. And Sidonia is also known as Cana because it was Canaan who was Ham's son who actually was the father of Sidon. Then you go to Mars. I mean, you go to Rome, who actually the Romans, according to the historian Livy, said they really did consider themselves sons of Mars, and they're also being suckled by a wolf or a canine. And notice this shepherd here, who's kind of helping things along with his pointy hat, magician hat. He knows what's going on. It says Rome here. It says Kaidon here. It's just a variation on the word Sidon. They're Cana Canaanites or Sidonians. And the reason that Cana is an important place is because that's the location where the watchers came down. The sons of Mars being suckled on the milk of knowledge. Richard Hoagland has talked extensively about tetrahedral geometry and the Sidonia monuments. And he talks about it existing as uh, that hallmark, that stamp that says there's intelligent design to it because it incorporates dimensionless constants in mathematics, things that don't depend on a numerical system. They just exist with any numerical system. And that's this tetrahedral signature here. It's just angle. So if you measure your circles in 33 or 55 or 360, you're still going to have this signature proportionally. And also pi is one of those great symbols, too, for actually ascertaining whether there's intelligence on a planet other than ours or some signal that's coming from outer space, like SETI does. They both pay attention to these two points. And pi is that one number that we know of that really does symbolize a circle. It's, it's almost magical. But these two things are incorporated interchangeably and together on Cydonia. It connects Mars to the Earth because there are many similarities. When you go back to the ancient knowledge and how it's pervaded, pi is everything when it comes to the compass that measures circles. If you know pi, then you know how to make circles and understand circles. So what if you were going to take the 33 points on the compass rows and actually be really literal about placing a line on the Earth where it would actually exist? Here's latitude, 33.3 degrees from zero, 2012 nautical miles. Now take that 33 and a third times pi. You'll come up with this. Well, it really seems like maybe this is latitude. Ah, this is latitude. Maybe this is longitude. So now you got the two points that you need to figure out where you are in space on the Earth. Guess where it is. I really think that this has something to do with why what happened in 1947 happened here. Because if you're working with SETI and you actually saw an equation that pointed this out and then something happened here, 
you would have your smoking gun for the uh, proof that something from outer space had been communicating with you that was intelligent enough to be able to, well, communicate. There's only one place on the planet that's associated with this connection of heaven to earth, and that's right in Roswell. Here, it's on top of a Tibetan plateau. So the Roswell co coordinates, longitude and latitude, are a function of pi. It goes backward and forward. You can multiply the latitude times pi and get the longitude, divide longitude by pi and get the latitude. Now there's more to that equation than even just pi. Leviathan itself, if you actually would look at the letters in the Hebrew, they equal numbers. And these numbers added together come up with a number here that is actually a function of pi too, and the number of days. Symbolically, it's actually saying it's a cycle. Our days are measured actually as we go around the sun in a complete circuit, and pi is the measurement or the symbol of that circuit. It's saying it's a connection, and it's interesting because the language here actually means a connected serpent, and the numbers say the same thing. It's a function of time. And so if you take all this together, the dimensions of the Earth in nautical miles, 21,600, and you divide it by 33, you'll get a symbol, a uh, number that's actually close to what the aeon is. You just have to move the decimal place over one. And it's because this number is so versatile, so powerful that it's rever revered. It's also, uh, at sim simultaneously, it connects time to space. It connects heaven to earth. It connects Mars to earth. It connects us to the divine through what's going on in Jerusalem and or what went on in Jerusalem and what will go on in Jerusalem. But you take all these numbers and you can actually create an equation here. Take the distance around the earth in nautical miles, divide it by 33.33, the most sacred number according to the illuminated fraternities. You get the number, the number of the quaternary of the procession. Divide that by 19.47, you get exactly the place where I believe the Roswell crash happened in latitude. Multiply this by pi, and you get the longitude exactly. It works in a mirror sort of image. You can continue to write this equation in a circle. Now, if you take this equation and actually plot it on a map, you see that here's the beginning of 33 degrees, and here's the end of 33 degrees, where it actually would become latitude 34. So this is the only line that I actually would actually plot. And it's a function of pi in each little point. And the very middle here is where this equation works. It's actually telling us something. It seems to be warning us about a point in the future. Here's a map with a little star plotted there for you if you want to actually go out there. I left that there for some strange reason. <laughs> so I guess I was trying to get out here. And so this is what Roswell says geometrically. There's even more to it than that, because there's actually a suggestion that it's connected to the birthday of our own country. Of course, it's in America, but I looked into that too. And it comes into sort of a spooky range, a, a, a kind of a, I want to say an esoteric sort of theurgic range of math, because by just playing with this decimal point, you can actually get the, lat the longitude of the Roswell event the crash place. Just move the decimal plate over and put a zero there uh, and uh, divide it into 17 point, or 1776. And you can continue by putting these other symbols, these other geometric uh, signatures in a line here. But what's interesting is our symbol by choice is the eagle. And if you look at the history and the actual genesis of this symbol, it was originally not as Benjamin Franklin said, an eagle, it was a phoenix. I think that maybe these illuminated uh, founders of our country had a lot going for them when they looked at what we were doing in, uh, in, in perspective of the future. I think they understood what the phoenix represented. I think they understand this time cycle. I think they were looking forward to the future. I think a future that is ours. Now, you can connect these, these equations, and 
I could stay in this little <coughs> frame for way too long, so I, I won't. You get the idea. You also get the motif of the, uh, the phraseology that's repeated over and over again. The compass rolls it is what you use to navigate in, in uh, earth, to know where you're connected under heaven. The rose cross, which is another symbol of this idea of having a connection with heaven. And then, of course, rose well, which may be a stretch, but, you know, water <laughs> is something that roses need to grow. And, of course, in Hebrew, if your head is a rosh, if you need to live, you need water. To learn, you need to fill your head. But it's also a function of a geometric system of understanding time. And if we understand time, we can understand the future and what the divine is all about and what the divine's plans are. Um, by the way, the actual name for Ezekiel's wheel was Gagalim, which incorporates the same idea here, Gagal, with Golgotha, the head, the crossbones, and you have this symbol that goes in between here, the, the cross that actually connects the four points of the zodiac, the cardinal points. Now we get into something that's heavier. Everyone, I think, if they connect 2012 to prophecy, will understand that there's something to do with the Mayan calendar. This is actually the sunstone. It's an Aztec calendar that they borrowed from the Maya. Um, it was buried by the Spanish in uh, Tenochtitlan and not discovered for maybe 200 years. It's about 12 feet across. It's huge. It weighs about five tons. They, uh, they buried it. And then it was rediscovered in the 1700s. And interestingly enough, you can actually, no, not the 1700s. Don't quote me on this. But you can actually see here that they've recorded these four little destructive epics on the Earth. Each one of these represents 6,480 years in between each one and a destructive epic, one by flood, one by fire, one by animals or something. And uh, there's one by earthquakes. And there's one left because the calendar ends here. It just so happens that we know now what that's all about when it comes to how the galaxy is aligned with uh, the ecliptic and how that aligns with the solstice. It just so happens that that's the solstice. Here you have Quetzalcoatl, the serpent god, who lives in the heavens. He's his name actually means the feathered serpent, so that's an allusion to the idea that he's up in heaven. And he has a guy protruding from his head. This guy hasn't been eaten. He's willingly leaving the body because he's an avatar. He's a manifestation in human form of this great serpent god that lives in heaven. And that's, in fact, why Cortez was able to, to uh, pull one over on Montezuma so easily because Montezuma was actually anticipating a man coming uh, from another place to set a new age into motion to actually come and... Uh, set into motion a golden age. It's the same sort of idea that the Freemasons have of moving from out of one order into a next order. And here, this is from the book of Revelation. And it said that this tail is sweeping a third of the stars from heaven. Well, a third of anything from 100% is 33.33. And we know that 33.33 on the Earth in degrees is 2,012 miles, 0.9 to get really specific. That puts you right in the ballpark of this. Same date. Now, we got a lot of connections. Serpents, heavenly serpents, time, and space. And the dragon motif is kind of strange because it keeps talking about this red dragon, a big red one. Um, it's rose colored, of course. There's uh, uh, a lot of information in um, that just suggesting Mars, but the actual word dragon from Greek, drakian, means to look or watch. And these greys have actually called themselves watchers. At least those channeling them say they have. And so Enoch has a lot to say about the watchers. In fact, he says that it was them that actually caused the flood to have to happen. And he says that they taught men secret things. And that's why, they were, uh, uh, that's why they were judged on the earth with the flood. But he also connects the name Watcher with Angel. Now here is where the whole UFO phenomenon comes in. And the whole idea of what might be taking place with the manifestations in the heaven. Enoch 
actually defines two different sets. He talks about spirits that were born on the earth. And there's, there's some variations in demonology of where demons come from. One is the idea that they were created as a kind of a lower form of a spirit, sort of evil, on the earth. They don't have bodies. The other, other side of the argument is that they were actually the spirits that indwelt these giants that were created by the watchers themselves. And when their bodies were destroyed in the flood, they had no more bodies left, and they had to just fend for themselves. They can uh, manifest in objects and other beings, but they don't have any bodies of their own. And the watchers are a different and distinct group. They're the spirits of heaven who were promiscuous with women. They assume many forms. They lead men astray so that they sacrifice to demons as gods until the time of the great judgment, the time of their consummation of sin. There's going to be an end point to what they're doing. Ephesians in the New Testament actually explains more into this too. He, Paul's talking about the Christian's walk in life, and he says, before, before you were saved, you walked according to the course of this world, the prince of the powers of the air, the spirit that works in the sons of disobedience. Ephesians 6, he again gets into this idea that they're spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. In the Greek, atmospheros, they live up in the air, these beings. And according to what Enoch is saying, if they were demons, we wouldn't see them. So the only alternative then, of course, from the paradigm of Enoch is that they're watchers and they're taking on whatever form they want. But they're not going to be able to do this forever. Apparently, they're going to be cast down. And as Enoch connected the name angel to watcher, we look at the future of the ones who rebelled, the watchers or the angels that rebelled, and there's going to be a point when they're thrust down to the earth. And it connects the name for dragon, which is another word for watcher in Greek. It talks about how they're not found in heaven anymore. There's no place for them in heaven any longer, which means that they're coming to earth. Isaiah even talks about that same sort of scenario when he talks about the day of the Lord. He'll punish the fallen angels. And they're rounded up and put in a prison. And then they're tried and condemned. I think that Isaiah and Revelation 12 are connected with this idea that the angels that rebelled are thrust down to the earth. When you look at the um, actual motif of 33 that's found in geometrically you know, a third of anything, and every time it's listed in the New Testament here on Revelation and in the Old Testament, I found it in Zechariah, it's always connected to this judgment. One after another, you know, Everything's burned up, sea becomes blood, everything that lived in it dies, on and on and on. So, with the idea that 33 has a connection to a, a point in time, 2012, it connects us to where it all happened here, the point of contention in Jerusalem, with this number, 33, with the symbology that's repeated redundantly over and over again that means more than one thing but especially points to a point in the future where some force in heaven is going to intersect with the earth again. And take a look at Jerusalem. Things actually are measured in the relationship to Jerusalem. The three major players in ownership over Jerusalem after its fall by the Romans. First it would be Islam, which was founded in 630 AD. And Istanbul and the Turks were the last Islamic nation to actually rule Jerusalem. In nautical miles, they are within 630 nautical miles of 632. That's amazing because the armies of Muhammad actually uh, uh, took over Palestine in 632. Napoleon very briefly invaded Palestine, and he actually wrote out uh, a letter that was declaring Palestine a new home for the Jews. And, of course, it only lasted for a year, but that was in 1799 the same amount of nautical miles between Jerusalem and Paris. And, of course, Israel became a nation, a sovereign nation, in 1948, but before that, of course, it was ruled by the British. So if you go from Jerusalem to London, that's 1,948 nautical miles. 
It all goes back to the first point of contention, the first connection between heaven and earth with a being from heaven and a human. The names are even mentioned over and over again. We have Sidonia on Mars. We have Sidonia as the actual fruit of the tree of knowledge. You have the serpent on the pole. You have the rose on the cross, this idea of a, a head that's uh, in charge somehow. The Proto-Evangelicon, the very first good news that was given to men was in Genesis, and it said that the woman would crush the head of the serpent, or the offspring of the woman would crush the head of the serpent, or the serpent would strike the heel of the offspring of the woman. Well, in the illuminated uh, paradigm, you have this serpent in, in uh, name, in the symbolic name, ruling men, giving them more knowledge, bringing them closer to what it seems like the goal was here, but was interrupted by God. It's all about becoming immortal. It's all about moving into the plane of immortality for human beings. But that's been covered. The tree of life actually exists. We actually can go to the tree of life right now. So I think it's a pretty interesting idea because I said so the tree of life is uh, guarded by cherubim and, and swords, but the Messiah actually has created uh, a way for us to gain access to it. Now, I looked at the name for Jerusalem, and I found that it equals the same as Leviathan. In the modern actual uh, uh, writing of Jerusalem, they have another yod here, but the ancient writing is this way. It actually equals the same strange connection of circles and days as Leviathan. And I think that there's an analogy here. You'll actually see the Leviathan crosses in this configuration of how the ecliptic with the symbols and the, the actual tribes of Israel are arranged around this temple or, or tabernacle. Leviathan goes right through the center of it. And the tabernacle, of course, and the temple exist only in Jerusalem. And you have the man over here and the line over here. So you have the first advent and the second advent. And you have the actual symbols that connect this to time and space on our earth. It's all about playing out this understanding of what God's doing here on earth spiritually through men that's a point of contention. We're becoming immortal through what Christ has done, but we're demonstrating this to the myriads of beings that exist out in heaven. They're watching us. That's why they're called watchers. Through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the principalities and powers in heavenly places according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Messiah Jesus our Lord, which is what a Christian actually inherits when he unwittingly, I think, moves into becoming an immortal being by accepting what Christ did on the cross. It's a huge thing. And I think we're, the generation's going to see some of the most dynamic changes in the church since the actual first advent. Thanks very much. so warm. <laughs>